presentation is from the ASHRAE EHVC Applications Handbook. Um, the most recent one was 2011. I believe next summer we're getting the new ones. But uh, And uh, the snow and ice smell is in Chapter 51. Uh, we'll also be referencing um, some information uh, from Rayo, They're the manufacturer of uh, PEX that we use and snow mold equipment. Um, it certainly applies to all manufacturers. Um, most manufacturers supply uh, different uh, tools, you know, to help you lay out. Um, so we're just using theirs for this example. As I said, it certainly applies to other manufacturers. So why melt the snow versus uh, have it removed uh, normally? Well, first and foremost is convenience. Um, not having to have another company come every time it snows. Uh, safety, uh, less damage and maintenance. Uh, no salt is a big thing. As you know, salt can deteriorate concrete. Uh, can cause problems tracking it into buildings. Um, you don't have to have someone go out and salt the sidewalks or stairs. Um, and there's no damage to landscaping or the parking lot with plows. Um, another big item here would be there's nowhere to put the snow, um, especially in tight areas or uh, cul-de-sacs tight in parking lots. Um, having nowhere to put the snow can be a huge problem. It just piles up over time, uh, especially last winter when snow after snow start getting big mounds and there's nowhere else to put it. Um, it also reduces liability. Um, if you have ramps and stairs, uh, you don't have to worry about people uh, slipping on ice. Um, reliability. Uh, as we go through, you'll see most of these systems, once they're installed within a slab or in the ground, uh, there's very little problems with them, very little maintenance. Um, obviously, if there's a boiler or heat exchanger associated with it, there's going to be some regular maintenance with those items. but. The loop field itself is very durable. Um, minimizes the environmental impact. Uh, you don't have snow trucks coming and uh, removing everything, so there's all the gas and whatnot associated with that. And uh, as we mentioned before, no salt. And in most cases, with a high efficiency boiler, um, you're reducing the cost versus paying someone to come remove the snow. Uh, it can pay itself back. You know in a decent amount of time depending on the size of the system. So where can you use it? You can use it pretty much anywhere that gets snow and ice. Um, there's a large list here, the, the ones you see all the time, roads, sidewalks, ramps. Um, you can use them for pool and spa decks, uh, for large residences in the winter. Um, that People would still want to be using a hot tub, for example. Uh, some big ones that we've seen lately are train platforms are starting to put in radiant, uh, especially at least on the ramps and stairs, um, intake plenums and, or penthouses uh, with air handlers to prevent any snow or ice from building up. Uh, car washes is always a big one, uh, the in and out. And uh, as you can see, a, a lot of other options as well, helicopter pads, uh, runways, airports, uh, anywhere that snow builds up. Uh, that you would prefer it didn't. So can we design a system that will account for all the weather conditions in every possible situation? No, we can't. Uh, the snow, uh, you know, it's obviously variable. Last winter was insane. The winter before that, relatively mild. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll see later in the presentation is we'll base it on um, ASHRAE data based on previous snows and uh, We'll use that to approximate um, a given situation, or sorry, based on a given situation, uh, how much uh, weather we'd like to account for. So when we look at the design process, there's tons of different factors that affect the snow and ice melt loads, um, the air temperature when it's snowing, the rate, the wind velocity, uh, humidity levels, uh, snow density and uh, the temperature of the ground or the slab uh, at the start of the snowfall. So what we're going to do is go through the design process. Uh, I like to start with the installation, um, just the strategy and the layout, because if, if you go through the whole design and then determine that it's you know not going to fit in the space properly, then it was all for naught. 
Uh, then we'll get into heat flux, uh, which helps us design the, the design output, uh, which leads us to the melting load in step three. Uh, we'll address the heat source and then the control strategy and finally the loop design. So things to consider with the installation. Uh, first, the surface. Uh, we can install these in most any situations, um, but it's very important to know what your surface is uh, before you start. So if it's going to be a concrete slab, or you have an existing slab or staircase that you're going to be putting an overpour or topping on, uh, you can put it under an asphalt parking lot or uh, other pathway. Uh, pavers are stone or gray. Sorry, uh, grass fields uh, for snow melt on uh, stadiums or other uh, you know academic fields for whatnot. Um, the fasteners, how it's going to be installed. Uh, typically, we uh, attach the pipe to a wire mesh for the pour. Um, we also have you know depending on the manufacturer, you have different uh, sets of like fastening rails or. Uh, you can staple it to foam if you're using that for your insulation. Uh, as far as insulation goes, uh, you can use rigid uh, foam. You can use uh, rolls of, sorry, I keep switching that. You can use rolls of uh, poly, polyethylene uh, insulation, uh, which we'll talk about later. Another important consideration is the drainage. Uh, you're going to be melting a lot of snow. You have to make sure that you're accounting for somewhere to send all the water. Otherwise, it'll melt off the surface and could ice up somewhere else down the line. Uh, also important with drainage is uh, if you're using trench drains, you have to take that into account uh, with the, the loop uh, design. Uh, finally, uh, locations. You have to make sure to allow for uh, your manifolds to be located within proximity to the field. Uh, you want to make sure the interconnecting piping runs from the manifolds back to the heat source are feasible. Um, the shape and of, of the, the, the area being snow melted is also important. If, if you have a weird shape and you can't run piping from the farthest point back to the manifold, um, you're going to have to address that as well. And I, as, as I was just saying, you know, is it feasible? Uh, in some cases, uh, a hydronic system is not always going to be the best answer. Uh, like I said, based on you know, proximity to the source and proximity to where you can locate manifolds. So here we show some different services that we can address and different uh, types of installations. Um, top left, you know, you have your standard sidewalk or parking lot. Um, to the right of that, we show an asphalt uh, ramp. Uh, some pavers on the bottom right, and then a concrete ramp down here on the left. As you can see here on the left, um, we need to address the trench drains uh, and other, any other drainage problems. And then on the right, you got a, uh, this is a giant ramp, but as you can see, they've addressed uh, the manifold location by mounting it in the wall. Um, with ramps, you can mount them underneath. You can mount them on the wall. As you can see here, this is an existing concrete ramp that they're putting a topping on. So that's an option. Here we have uh, your standard, uh, what, what, I don't know what you want to call it, drawing for that's put on plans. Uh, it gives us just a nice quick preview of how this looks. Uh, you're going to have insulation on the bottom and on the edges, ideally. Uh, pipe here is fastened to uh, wire mesh, as I mentioned before, and then you're pouring the concrete over. So the manufacturer will dictate uh, how much concrete you need over the top of the tube. Here it shows a, a minimum of two inches. Uh, typically it's about uh, two, two times the thickness of a pipe. So if you're using uh, you know, five-eighths, uh, three-quarters, it's a little less than two inches, but two inches is a good rule of thumb. Uh, here just shows some different applications all in one picture. Um, as you can see here, they have some concrete um, with a nice little border. But it shows that uh, you can use it on the ramps. Uh, you can use it in a turnabout. Um, 
you just have to make sure when you're doing a project like this scale and this shape that you're okay mounting the manifolds uh, in the landscaping or uh, depending on how it's set up since there's parking under this it looks like they may be underneath so just different things to address uh, when you start the in initial planning of your system so now we're going to move on to uh, the heat flux and the heat flux is the heat flow rate per unit surface area. So in this case, we're going to be looking at uh, BTUs per hour per square foot. And uh, ASHRAE, when, to calculate this, uh, ASHRAE has about 15 different equations, I believe it is, that help you uh, walk through and uh, the, the calculation for the heat flux. Uh, it's very time consuming and you have to do it for uh, different uh, times of year and different uh, different hourly distributions for each of the different part uh, components. So what they've done is they've gone and tabulated it uh, based on two different criteria, uh, the snow free area ratio and the frequency distribution, which we'll uh, discuss. So the snow free area ratio is basically addressing uh, how much snow is allowed to be on the surface as melting is taking place. So uh, as you can see here, it's basically just a ratio of, like I said, snow-free area over the total area uh, allowed. And ASHRAE has gone and tabulated this into three different values. Uh, one um, is 100% snow-free area which would be there's no accumulation during snowfall. Uh, 0.5 would be some accumulation, uh, about 50% of the surface, obviously. And then uh, a zero free area would be that snow is allowed to accumulate on the surface while melting is taking place. And I, as I note here down on the bottom, uh, snow is a great insulator. So having some snow on the surface uh, will help save energy. It reduces the heat flux, uh, as we'll see. So um, in non-critical areas, there's no reason having a little snow there is, a, is be an issue. Um, it's not going to allow a ton of buildup or ice, so it won't cause an unsafe condition. But um, like in a parking lot, for example, having a little snow there is not an issue. This is just an example of uh, a 0.5. So as you see on the left, uh, the street is starting to melt it. Um, there's some uh, snow sitting on the surface. And then as you can see on the right, this is after the full melting has taken place. So it'll keep operating until uh, it has evap melted and evaporated or drained off. And, uh, and like I said, it ends up saving a lot because your heat flux is a lot lower. So this is table one uh, from chapter 51 of the, the handbook uh, detailing the frequencies of some melting surface heat fluxes at steady state conditions. So basically we have the different locations tabulated here on the left uh, to you the snowfall hours per year. Um, as you can see up here on the top, uh, this is about uh, 10, 13 year uh, from 82 to 93 that they've gone through and tabulated and uh, this is estimated based on that. So the second column here, sorry, third column uh, shows the snow-free areas that I mentioned um, from 0, 1.5, and 1. And then the percentages across the top here represent how much of the snow falls uh, you want to be um, covered uh, in your calculation. So a more critical area would be 99 to 100 percent, 98. Uh, something not as critical would be 75, 90. And as you can see, so uh, we'll do. We'll go through an example that'll show uh, how we use this. But uh, as you can see here, uh, obviously the the higher percentage and the higher snow free ratio. Uh, the heat flux is quite a bit larger than uh, the opposite. Uh, the next part of selecting this 
um, will come down to the, the manufacturers. Um, sorry. So for Ray how they've tabulated um, for different common applications what they would recommend is a free area ratio and a frequency distribution. So for example here, a private residential driveway, uh, they have a free area ratio of zero, which would allow some accumulation during uh, melting, and then a frequency distribution of 75%. So if we go back to that chart real quick, uh, for Chicago, zero and 75% is only 23 BTUs per hour per square foot, which is relatively low when you're looking at snow melting. Now, when we say uh, 75% um, and, and that zero ratio, this is enough, this is per ASHRAE enough heat flux to cover, to melt the snow efficiently uh, with a little snow on the surface because we're at a zero uh, free area ratio for 75% of the snowfalls. Now that doesn't mean that the other 25%, the system's not going to work. It's just going to allow more snow to build up uh, in heavier snows, and it'll take longer to melt, obviously. So if we start here with an example of a Chicago apartment building sidewalks, um, and we'll use there's a hundred square, a thousand square feet total, uh, just for uh, our example, keep things simple. Um, per Ray House recommendations or the manufacturer's recommendations, uh, the apartment building sidewalk would be a free area ratio of one, so no accumulation, and a frequency distribution of 98%. So if we go to our ASHRAE table, and I've uh, pulled an excerpt of it right here for Chicago, that would give us a heat flux of 186 BTUs per hour per square foot. So how do we use this to determine the melting load? Pretty straightforward. We're going to take the heat flux, multiply by the area, and then we'll also include, uh, per the manufacturer, uh, a back loss uh, factor. And the back loss is used to estimate uh, the amount of energy needed uh, to overcome the downward and edge losses. Um, it would obviously vary based on location or uh, the type of installation. For example, if you have a ramp and there uh, is exposed on the bottom, this you you would want a, uh, a larger um, factor here. And then it also has to do with insulation. So it's the typical uh, amount to use would be 20%, uh, and that's um, assuming 10 an R10 insulation. Um, we'll talk about insulation a later. Uh, those that have a radiant bearer tend to be more effective, even though they have a, a lower R value, or even when you're using uh, like, a, like a foam, you still want to have a, a nice a, a foil face is always helpful. So if we go to our example, we have 186 BTUs per hour per square foot from the table times 1,000 square feet times 1.2. And that gives us our melting load down here, so a little over 223 MPH. All right, real quick, we're going to stop for our first poll question, and uh, I'll answer some of the questions we had come in. So if you guys go ahead and answer that. Okay, we got a question here. Um, is there a detail that can be put up to show where the installation is installed? Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to go through and uh, explain the different types of insulation and, and where you want to install it. Uh, so I'll address that a little bit later. Uh, the second question was, uh, does the heat flux number include insulation? How much? Uh, that would be the back loss. Uh, that we were just talking about. So uh, looks like we're good there. Looks like 80% of you have voted, so we'll give it another minute or two to uh, get everyone in.
All right, we'll give it 10 more seconds, get your questions in. Sorry, your answers. All right, we'll go ahead and close this. All right, so pretty much everyone got it. The heat flow, or sorry, the heat flux is the heat flow rate per unit surface area. And uh, in English units, it's we're using it's BTUs per hour per square foot. So good work on there. All right, so now that we have our melting load, uh, we're going to address the heat source. And in addition to the melting load, when we're, when we're sizing the heat source, we also want to consider the pickup load or the idling load. So if you're starting the melting process from a cold slab, there's going to be uh, a load and time required to get the slab up to the proper temperature to melt, which is usually considered a 38 degree surface temperature. And this can vary based on the control scheme as we'll talk about later and your customer's requirements. Um, if it's a critical area, you'll likely want to have the, the slab uh, at like an idling temperature that would allow uh, melting to start uh, a lot sooner. But uh, nonetheless, it's something that we need to consider in the heat source and we'll consider the controls uh, later on. Also, we want to uh, address uh, multi-purpose heat source considerations. So if you're using uh, the heat source uh, for other purposes other than um, the snow melt, um, that'll affect the sizing, obviously. Um, the efficiency of the equipment you're using and how that can affect the piping requirements. And then uh, we won't talk about it too much here, but uh, free heat, if it's available in the building, whether it's from a heat reclaimed chiller or you're trying to dump heat from any other source uh, with a heat exchanger or uh, other equipment, using that for snow melt is ideal. As it's, like I said, free heat. <laughs> so first we're going to address the pickup load here. Um, and what this is, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> pardon me, is the energy required to bring the system up to melting temperature. <clears throat> Pardon me. So a 38 degree surface temperature. We want to consider this along with the melting load when we're sizing the system. Uh, we may oversize the heat source so that uh, the pickup load is uh, accounted for. Sorry. So for concrete, uh, this is tabulated uh, usually by the manufacturers, but we're going to assume approximately 30 BTUs to raise a cubic foot of concrete one degree. So this will allow us to account for, uh, with this equation down here, the square, sorry, the square footage of the area, uh, the pickup delta T, uh, the, as I said, the tabulated pickup uh, load requirement, and then we'll also include for back losses. So for our example, we have 1,000 square feet. We'll assume a 20 degree delta T going from an 18 degree uh, slab temperature uh, before uh, heating and a 38 degree surface temperature needed to start melting. Um, we'll assume, uh, since we're doing a sidewalk, that it's a four inch concrete slab. So if we take into account our 30 BTU uh, number from the manufacturer, that would be 10 BTUs per hour per square foot. And we will use uh, 1.15 as the uh, back loss coefficient here, which is typical uh, per the manufacturer for a uh, concrete slab for pickup. And that gives a pickup load of 230 MBH. 
So we have a melting load of 223 MBH approximately, pickup load that's a little larger. So if we were to size our heat source exactly based on the melting load, um, as you can see here, our pickup hour would be approximately one hour. So for an apartment sidewalk, that's perfectly acceptable. You would not need to oversize the heat source uh, to account for the pickup load. Uh, for a larger thermal mass, uh, which if we go back to the equation, you can understand if the square area is much larger and the thickness of the slab is much larger, uh, your pickup load is going to be quite a bit larger than your melting load. So you may, sorry, so you may oversize your heat source and your, and your circulation to account for this so that the pickup load is, sorry, the pickup time is much shorter uh, depending on the application. Now usually if it's an application that needs a quick pickup time, you'll consider uh, keeping the slab at an elevated temperature in, in an idling mode as we'll discuss later with controls so that it can offset uh, the pickup load and you won't have to oversize your heat uh, source by as much. So first, uh, here at the top, uh, multi-purpose heat source sizing. What, what, what I'm referring to here is if you're using a, a boiler that's in a building uh, that's serving other items, whether it's air handlers or radiant flooring or whatnot, um, your peak heating load for the building is not going to be coincident with the peak snow melting load. 90% uh, of your snowfall occurs between 10 and 35 degrees. So when you're evaluating your building at negative 4, negative 10, or 0, uh, your snow melting is not going to be occurring at the, same, at the same point. So it's something to keep in mind when designing the size. A lot of times, uh, people will automatically you know, just tack on the snow load to the building load, and that's not necessarily the case. You can end up with the an oversized boiler and a lot more equipment uh, costs than you really need. Another, another important thing to consider is the temperature requirement. For a snow melting system, uh, we'd like water between 120 to 140 degrees uh, as a supply temp. Now, based on the manufacturer, uh, they have software that can help you calculate your actual uh, temperatures required and and output temperatures. Um, you can operate with a lower temperature, um, but it, it'll be taken into account with the manufacturer's software. Uh, typically, we look at about 130 degrees as a really good uh, supply temperature to start with. Also important when considering the heat source is whether or not you need to isolate the system. If you're using a dedicated boiler, which we'll look at next, uh, this isn't really an issue. If it's part of another system, uh, the snowmelt system will obviously need glycol. Um, it's obviously operating at a temperature that's different than other boilers, or sorry, different other sources. Um, you may be using steam as your source, and so you'd need a heat exchanger for that. And then if you're using a system that already has glycol in it, but you need different water temperatures, uh, you may consider mixing, or if it doesn't have glycol in it, you'll use a heat exchanger. So here, just a couple sample piping diagrams. Uh, this one on the top right is a very low cost way to mix down for, um, for a snowmelt system, just using a basically a three-way valve that's manually set. Uh, this one to the bottom left uh, shows, a, you know, a, a, three-way valve with an actuator that can be controlled by a BAS system or a local control. And then on the right here, uh, using a brace plate heat exchanger, uh, you have to make sure to consider having uh, an expansion system, a glycol feeder, uh, pumps on the supply and uh, output side. And you always want to make sure to have pressure relief on the, on the snow melt side as well. So if we're using a dedicated boiler, um, it's 
important to consider the efficiency of the equipment you're using. Uh, here on the left, if we're using a non-condensing boiler, so typical 80% boiler, anything that cannot see certain return temperatures, we need to use four-way mixing and the appropriate control to, per, to monitor the return temperature to the boiler as well as the supply temperature to the slab. Um, if we're using a condensing boiler, even if it's a single loop, you want primary, secondary piping. Um, the pump relay control, in most cases, will allow the, uh, will start the circulator for the zone first with the delay. So it may be able to satisfy the call uh, with the, the heat that's already in the loop. It will only kick on the boiler as needed. All right, we'll go to our second poll question. I'll answer some of the questions that have come in. Uh, first question here, uh, except during frequent snowfall or very critical applications, isn't idling a huge waste of energy? In most cases, it can be, absolutely. Uh, it depends on the size of the application and really goes back to the amount of thermal mass. Um, if you have a thicker slab, a larger area, idling can, can have its benefits. Uh, we'll, we'll continue our example later on to do uh, some uh, cost analysis, um, which obviously can be applied to any other project. And we'll, we'll show, you know, applications where it's more beneficial than others. Um, but yeah, in our example, as we'll show, it, it definitely can be a huge waste. Um, next question. What sets the assumed minimum slab temp? Uh, the numbers that I'm using, uh, 18 degrees as the, the uh, starting temp and 38 degrees as the melting temp, uh, are from the, the ASHRAE uh, guidelines. Um, they, they can be adjusted, um, they're tabulated as well in the ASHRAE handbook, um, but your manufacturer will also have uh, numbers that they would like to see uh, to ensure you know, proper operation. Uh, next question, typical delta T for the snow melt loop. Uh, we'll get into that when we look at the flow. Uh, typically, it can be anywhere from 15 to 30. Uh, our office uh, recommends always designing around 20. Um, in most cases in the field, it will operate between 20 and 25 if you design around 20. Um, a lot of manufacturers do not recommend uh, using 30 or above uh, just because it can affect the properties of the slab. Um, if you're not using a concrete slab, that obviously changes things, but uh, typically we, we recommend 20, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, next question was, have you run into any, run into many jurisdictions where ice melt systems have not been allowed by the energy code? I have not been, I have not found any, uh, jurisdictions that have uh, not allowed it. Um, that being said, I, I'm only seeing the projects after they've been uh, a, like preliminarily designed. So, um, but it, as far as I'm aware, I've never run into it. Um, why can't we use primary only system when using a condensing boiler? Uh, technically, uh, you can but it's really up to the boiler manufacturer. Uh, the boilers that we use, they always want a primary loop. Um, as I was alluding to, it really helps um, because you can use the system circulator to, to run uh, the system um, to, to, to meet the demand before trying to kick on the boiler. So it prevents cycling and uh, obviously leads to higher efficiencies. All right, so most of you got your poll questions in. I'm going to go ahead and close it.
and if you guys got it right, of course, uh, the, the pickup load is the amount of energy needed to bring the thermal mass up to melting temperatures. All right, so now that we have the, the load and the heat source kind of set up, um, we're going to address the controls. There's obviously tons of different controls. Um, most of them boil down to a few different types here. Um, and then there's obviously you can always integrate with a, a building automation system. Uh, but the first uh, and most common, except on, you know, on larger jobs, would be a fully automatic system, which has a moisture detection with active control. It will melt until all the moisture is drained or evaporated from the surface using a moisture sensor mounted on the slab. Um, so it'll detect when there's snow. It'll keep melting until there's no moisture on the sensor. And it'll take into account the outdoor temperature, the slab sensor, and uh, the fluid temperature, as you can see here. Uh, most of the controls that have these options also have built-in uh, options for idling and setback and uh, several other features. Uh, the next, uh, which is more popular on smaller systems, just based on cost, uh, it has moisture detection, and then it'll shut off with the timer control. So instead of actively monitoring the, the moisture, what the, what the detector will do, which is usually an aerial sensor, will once the snow melt, uh, sorry, the snowfall has stopped, so it's not receiving any more moisture on the sensor, it'll run for a preset time, uh, you know, three hours, five hours, whatever you set it at. Uh, some of these uh, aerial sensors can work with uh, controllers that have uh, options for slab temperature, fluid temperature, and other uh, monitoring. Um, obviously, the more features, the more cost. Uh, typically, in a residence, um, we like to use, uh, I'll show you a couple examples of controls, um, but we like to use the semi-automatic just be based on cost. Uh, the next would be uh, just a timer control. So uh, it's manually started. Someone hit, turns on the timer, it runs for a certain amount of time, and then you turn it off. Um, you can associate this with uh, a control for monitoring the slab or the fluid temperature if you like. Usually if you're running a timer, though, it's a special application and you don't need the, all the details. Um, the last would be a manual. Basically, you turn it on, it runs, you turn it off. Uh, we would never recommend this. Um, if someone leaves it on, you're just, you know, wasting energy. You can do damage to the slab without any monitoring and whatnot. Other things you might want to consider with any of these controls, um, if you're using a heat exchanger or a mixing valve to, uh, to supply the, the, temp the water for the zone, uh, a lot of times, uh, the control uh, for the snowmelt can also control these items, whether it's a circulator or a mixing valve, et cetera. Um, most common, I'm sure you all have seen like a Tecmar type control. Uh, they have versions that allow for mixing or a heat exchanger or even a steam valve and whatnot. You also want to consider the sensors. Uh, with a fully automatic, um, it's that expensive uh, sensor that sits in a socket in the slab or other uh, you know, material. Uh, it can be placed pretty much anywhere. You want to keep it out of the sun so that it doesn't prematurely turn off when the moisture is evaporated from the sensor. You want to put it um, kind of in a lower, uh, lower place on the system. So if you have a ramp towards the bottom, so as it's draining down, uh, it'll keep draining. Uh, until, or sorry, keep operating until the surface is uh, completely clear. And then you also want to consider zoning. Uh, in most cases, you can use one sensor to handle several different slabs if they're around a property. Um, but if they have different exposures, you might consider putting a sensor on each slab. So just some things to consider with the control. The main thing you want to differentiate between is a fully automatic control uh, that has an idling option, which is going to be more most of your commercial jobs, and then a semi-automatic uh, control, which is going to be 
most of your uh, residential jobs and some commercial jobs based on you know how cost prohibitive it is to go to the fully automatic. Here on the right is an example of the slab mounted sensor. Um, it has some resistance built into it so anytime there's moisture on the surface it knows and it also monitors the temperature of the slab. So between those two and the outdoor temperatures if there's moisture on it and it's between you know 38 or 38 degrees and lower uh, where snowfall can occur it'll kick on melt the slab remove the moisture. Uh, on the left is an example of an aerial control so snow uh, will come in through this opening on the top. It will detect it, uh, switch over, and start the melting system. Once it's not receiving any new moisture coming in, it'll, this particular model will run on a timer. Uh, other models of these are made to go into a, uh, you know, a Tecmar control, for example, and operate in conjunction with a slab sensor uh, to give you more options. So now that we have um, some different controls in our uh, heat exchanger, sorry, our heat source and everything set up. Let's go back to our example. So we have our 1,000 square foot Chicago apartment building sidewalks. Uh, we have our melting load, our pickup load. We'll size based on a 95% a high efficiency boiler and we'll use an electronic control with no idling since it's uh, just a small uh, thermal mass. So to figure out uh, your estimated operating costs, uh, we're going to use a, a table from ASHRAE, uh, same chapter that we were working for before. Um, what it does is it gives you tabulated melting and idling requirements, sorry, in hours per year and BTUs per square foot. Um, so for our example, uh, it shows that we have 124 melting hours per year and that that uh, is going to basically cost us or 8,501 BTUs per square foot. So our annual melting load would be our square footage times the square foot or the BTUs per square foot per, per year from the table. And then we have our pickup load. So if we estimate in those 124 hours the melting occurs in uh, 10 different snowmall events. Um, that's 10 times that we have to bring the, the slab up to temperature and that gives us our uh, annual pickup load. So we have a total pickup load of uh, 10.8 million BTUs per year. So if we create a little formula here uh, to convert to uh, dollars per million BTUs uh, we'll use a dollar per therm for this example. Obviously, you can plug in whatever your energy costs are for that area. Uh, and down here, we'll include the efficiency of the boiler, and that gives us ten point, sorry, ten dollars fifty-two cents per million BTUs. So, if we go back to our annual costs, it's going to cost us a little over one hundred and thirteen dollars per year to melt the snow on the apartment sidewalk. If we take a look at this uh, with idling, um, we'll assume that we're idling the uh, slab at 28 degrees. So that reduce, reduces our pickup load by half. Instead of bringing it from 18 to 38, we're bringing it from 28 to 38. Uh, if we go back to our table, um, I have 1,854 idling hours per year and we have a BTU per square foot per year idling uh, number and that will give us our uh, the amount of BTUs for idling. So as you can see this is about 10 times 15 sorry 12 times higher than uh, the load our annual load before so we'll add in our annual melting load and the, our reduced picking pickup load and that gives us a total annual load of a little over 126 million BTUs per year and a total cost of 1,334 and some change dollars per year. So for this 
application, we're talking nearly $1,200 extra, clearly not worth the uh, clearly not worth the, the extra uh, dollars to idle this load. Now we have a relatively low thermal mass as I mentioned before. So if you have a large thermal mass or the area is critical, um, the cost of the idling can be either more, more financially beneficial or it, depending on the area, you know, it might just be required. You won't have a choice. But that's, this is how you can estimate your cost for the system uh, so you can let your customers know uh, how much it's going to cost. If we go back to our uh, original cost here, you know, $113 per year to clear all your sidewalks is a huge benefit versus uh, having someone have to shovel, lay salt, uh, et cetera. So we'll switch gears here and uh, get back to our design process and look at the loop field sizing. Um, as far as the different items that we're going to need to address here, uh, here we're going to start with system flow, then we'll look at uh, you know, the loop lengths and whatnot, and then uh, the pressure drop, and finally sizing our circulators. First and foremost, we need to determine the system flow. Um, and when we're doing this, um, it's going to affect the pressure drop, obviously, the velocity and the tube size. Um, what you're going to do once you have your flow design, or your, you t once you figure the flow for the system, we'll use the manufacturer's tables to help us choose the appropriate size and loop length so that our velocity and pressure drop are acceptable. Um, we're going to assume here a 50% propylene glycol solution. Uh, typically, you always want at least 40%, uh, depending on the manufacturer of the glycol. Uh, they may recommend a different percentage between 40 and 50 for maximum freeze protection, uh, but any higher than 50% is not adding any additional freeze protection. So we'll assume 50% here. Uh, as I mentioned before briefly, uh, for the Delta T, we recommend designing at 20 degrees. Um, of all the systems that we have operating in Chicago, we design them at 20 degrees. They operate around 20 to 25, and have you know worked perfectly for you know 20 plus years in some cases, no issues. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in Ray House case, they don't want you to use 30 degrees or greater uh, when you're using a concrete slab, just to uh, prevent any thermal shock. Um, whether it you know the it's really up to the concrete, uh, you know, company to tell you if there's any limitations on it. But uh, as I said, 20 degrees is usually the best baseline. Uh, if we look at the, you know, classic uh, formula here for heat transfer, uh, we'll rearrange it to get us uh, GPM, um, and you're going to use the fluid density and specific heat for the glycol. If we use 50% uh, uninhibited propylene glycol, these are our values. And if we plug in uh, the numbers from our uh, example, which would be the melting load here, uh, we want to design for 25.29 GPM. All right, we'll do our third poll question here, and then I will address uh, some questions that have come in. All right, first question, uh, how can a slab sensor be consistently located out of the sun yet still receive, still receive snowfall moisture? Are there any tips you can share? Um, it's, you're right, it's impossible to have it uh, available to the, uh, you know, underneath in an area, sorry, that'll get snowfall and still be out of the sun all the time. Um, if you're on a ramp, um, for example, we usually recommend putting it closer to one of the walls on the, or one of the side walls so that, you know, except for a couple hours in the middle of the day, it'll have some shade. 
Um, if you're doing like a residential driveway, we recommend putting it up towards the garage um, or, you know, if it's any building, commercial building or whatnot, up towards the garage, um, just a little outside of the overhang so that, again, at least for half the day you're um, out of the sun. Obviously, like you said, it's impossible to uh, have it out of the sun all the time and still receive snowfall and moisture. Um, again, another uh, point I briefly made earlier, you, you ideally would like to have it lower on a ramp so that, you know, moisture is running down towards it. Um, that's not always, you know, feasible. Um, it has to be within a certain distance of your uh, control, usually, depending on the manufacturer. So, um, like I said, within reason, you can basically put them anywhere, um, but like you, if you can avoid putting them in an area that's going to get a lot of sun coverage, you don't want to have it out in the middle of the slab. Uh, you divided by the efficiency of the boiler, is that correct? I think you're referring to the equation we use for um, to calculate the operating costs. Um, you do divide by the efficiency in that equation because you're uh, basically increasing the cost uh, based on um, the output or the input of the boiler uh, when you divide by that. What is the maximum recommended loop length from the manifold? Uh, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, it's basically going to be how much um, how much pressure drop you're willing to overcome, um, and you really, you know, based on it could be a different range. You also want to be within velocity limits that the manufacturer represent recommends. Is 120 supply of water too hot for maintaining 38 degrees? Won't the slag temperature be closer to the boiler at or closer to 100 degrees? Uh, no, no. I'm, a supply temperature around uh, 100 to 140, as I mentioned before, is not going to get the slab that hot, uh, especially when the ground is so cold and the air temperature is so cold. Uh, Having it in that range, though, will provide the necessary, uh, will facilitate the necessary heat transfer uh, to keep it around uh, your delta T and still uh, transfer enough heat quickly enough to get the slab up to temperature. All right, looks like most of you have voted. I'll give you 10 more seconds to get your answer in. All right. Most of you got that right. Um, you do not want to have an on-off system. Uh, in any case, there should at the very least be a timer. Uh, those of you who pick the timer is pretty low on the totem pole as well. Um, we want to avoid those, you know, in most cases, but. Depending on the application, you know, if it's a small driveway or sidewalk for a house or a patio for a, a, a spa or a you know, hot tub, then a timer is often a good choice because they can just click it on a couple hours before they plan on using it, go out there, uh, have a good time, and then by the time they're done, the timer will click off and uh, the system will shut down. All right, so the next step now that we have the flow um, is to determine the different characteristics of the loop field. So the different things we need to consider are the pipe diameter. Uh, here I've listed 5 eighths and 3 quarters. Uh, those are most popular uh, just based on, you know, the flow that we need in, this, in the amount of space that we have uh, to maintain proper velocities. Uh, the loop length uh, typically depending on the pipe diameter and the flow, are between two and 300 for snow melting. Um, with 5 eighths, it's usually 200. With 3 quarters, 
it can be between 200 and 300, uh, depending on the uh, man manifold you're using. Um, and then the spacing uh, can be anywhere from 6 inches on center to 12 inches on center. In some cases, with larger diameters, you can go to 18 inches on center. For snow melt, um, we typically start with 9 inches on center. Um, as I mentioned down here at the bottom, the higher the heat flux is, uh, based on your area, the higher the flow rates are going to be, which are going to require you to have you know, some combination of shorter loop lengths, larger tubing, and tighter spacing in order to accommodate the flows while still maintaining proper velocities. Um, the manufacturer's uh, manifolds also have limitations. Um, I know working with Rayhow, uh, we have a standard manifold and an XL manifold that allow a larger flow per uh, loop. So that's obviously something to take into consideration. And then um, your allowable manifold locations may affect uh, your options as far as pipe diameter and loop length. Um, if, you, know, you may have a small area, but if it's a weird shape and you have to use longer loop runs, you're likely going to have to use a larger pipe diameter so you don't have an absurd uh, pressure drop. So this is an example of uh, a manufacturer's uh, tabulated data. So if you look here, you have your flow on the, the left. This first section uh, tabulates the flow velocity. Um, the second several are for different uh, water temperatures. We typically use the 60 degree Fahrenheit column for mm -hmm. snow melting, um, just to give us a nice baseline. Obviously, the water is going to start colder than that in some situations. Um, all that will happen is you'll have lower flow rates um, until the water is warm enough for it to overcome. And then you'll slowly uh, have higher flow rates and lower pressure drops. Um, but that's OK. Um, so we'll, we'll always start with this column for snow melting. Um, and then as you can see, you know, different pipe size, you go down, go across, and uh, that's your feet of head loss per 100 feet of pipe. Uh, they're also tabulated in PSI if you prefer, at least with Reha. Um, I'm sure other manufacturers are the same as well. So if you go back to our example, we have 1,000 square feet that we need to cover with tube. We have 25.29 GPM. And we're going to start with 5 8 tubing, uh, 200 feet loops, 200 foot loops, and 9 inch spacing. So first, we need to determine the total pipe length uh, with 9 inch spacing. We're looking at 1,333 feet of tube to go in our uh, 1,000 square foot area. So if we're using 200 foot loops, we'll uh, have 6.65 or 7 loops required for this area. And obviously, you can go back and determine the actual loop length will be less than 200 feet. But for our purposes of calculating, uh, we'll, we'll keep it at 200 feet for now. And then uh, if we divide uh, our total GPM for the system by the number of loops, we have 3.61 GPM per loop. So we'll go back to our chart here. And uh, we'll start on the left. Obviously, this falls uh, between 3 and 4. So you can interpolate an exact value or estimate. Um, if we were to use 5 eighths, as we said we would, we're probably looking at around 17 feet of head loss per 100 feet of pipe. Um, if we go back to our flow velocities, uh, we'll be around 4, which is pushing the limits. Um, as you can see here, the manufacturer has stepped this off, but you still, in most cases would like less than three and a half, four uh, feet per second in flow velocity as your maximum. Uh, so in this case, uh, we'll go ahead and switch over to the three quarter inch pipe and we'll assume uh, an eight foot uh, feet of head loss per 100 feet of pipe. So for a 200 foot loop length, we'll have to double that. We'll get 16 feet of head. And uh, that's just showing our situation before. 
Next, we have to evaluate the manifold. Uh, so this is using the manifold uh, provided by the manufacturer. Uh, depending on you know who the manufacturer is, we'll have this tabulated as well. Uh, in this case, we have a nice little graph. Uh, we'll go to our uh, 25 approximately GPM here at the bottom. We'll go up to the seven loop manifold, and that puts us uh, right around uh, 10 uh, feet of head loss for this manifold, for a seven loop manifold. So if we take all that into account, our final system is going to look like this. A little over 25 GPM at 26 feet ahead. So you can go size a circulator for that, or if you're you know, using a mixing valve, uh, that's the amount of flow you have to account for, for or a heat exchange or whatnot. Uh, we have our 250,000 BTU boiler, and then we have a seven station manifold with seven loops at three quarter inch pipe and 200 foot length at nine inch spacing. All right, let's do our last poll question here. This will finish up uh, the main portion, and then I'm just going to address a few more things, and then we'll be all finished up. I know we're going a little over an hour here, so I promise to be quick. All right, we'll give it about 10 seconds, and then I'll close it up. All right. Oh, fantastic. It wasn't a waste of time for any of you, so. Appreciate you guys listening in, and uh, let's get back to our presentation real quick. All right, uh, I just want to briefly go over a couple of rules of thumb that we're using uh, here in our office that help us uh, set up uh, preliminary systems and. Uh, a lot of this information is based on uh, Bill Bailey in our office has been working with Ray Howe and Radiant Systems uh, for about 30 years in the Chicagoland area. Um, we have different installations all over. If you ever would like to see one in action or see a setup, uh, we can arrange that. But typically, unless it's a critical area such as a, you know, a helicopter pad or a walkway at a hospital or you know senior center we typically use 125 BTUs per square foot per hour as an all-inclusive number so factoring in you know the heat flux the pickup load the losses uh, etc uh, in our situation uh, that our example was using um, you know for a thousand square foot we would say 125 MBH would be more than sufficient for that area. Uh, this is a value, like I said, has been used multiple times in the Chicagoland area, and we found it to be you know, extremely accurate and well-performing. Obviously, that's about half of what um, the ASHRAE data and the manufacturer data uh, has suggested. Um, it takes out a lot of the uh, safety factors that are built in between ASHRAE and the manufacturer. Um, but like I said, if you go back to um, the ASHRAE tables, um, you know, I think uh, 125 BTUs uh, is associated with a 90% uh, frequency distribution with a snow-free ratio of one, and it's also associated with about a 98% at a snow flow rate of zero. So it's covering 
you know, a lot of the bases. 90% of the time, it's not going to leave any snow on the surface. And with some snow on the surface, you're melting 98, 99% of all snowfall uh, occurrences. So, like I said, 125 BTUs is a very good all-inclusive number unless you have a very critical area. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in determining flow, we usually always use 20 degree delta T, even including, uh, you know, when you're sizing your uh, flow, uh, we include the glycol factor in that. So if we have 125 BTUs and we use a 20 degree delta T, we typically use the regular properties of plain water uh, in calculating the flow. So in that case, it'd be 12.5 GPM. And as I said, when you when you go to the actual operation of the system with all that factored in, uh, they're still working and operating very very well. Um, when I say uh, five eighths uh, tubing, 200 foot loops, nine inch spacings are typical. Uh, that's for uh, most systems. I would say probably up to approximately 300 square feet. Um, it really depends on how many manifold locations are allowed, uh, what size the manifolds are, uh, and wh where they're being located. Um, usually around that size and up, 3,000 square feet, um, I would switch to uh, a 3 quarter inch uh, tubing and uh, 225 to 300 foot loops, um, depending again on the manifolds being used. Um, the spacing. Um, I would always start with 9-inch spacing if you have a high heat flux for a critical area uh, to avoid uh, you know, inappropriate velocities. You have to go to 6-inch spacing, which would allow more loops and you know, so the flow is distributed uh, more. Uh, go through a couple additional notes. Uh, the first here is on insulation options. Um, a foam, as you see up here on the right, a foam board is going to likely give you a higher R value and you can get foil phase foam which is probably ideal. Um, you also want to include a vapor barrier when you're doing these. Um, a lower cost option um, that we use a lot um, are the poly rolls that have um, a double layer of bubble insulation, a vapor barrier, and an uh, aluminum uh, layer for radiant. Um, Anything that has a radiant barrier is going to help uh, considerably more. Um, like I said, lower cost. Uh, sorry, lower cost to a foil or to a rigid, uh, rigid foam. Uh, it's also easier to install. Uh, it can take more of a beating. Uh, anyways, the one thing I want to address here is you do not want to use insulation when you're using a porous surface. So if you have pavers or even asphalt, you do not want to put insulation underneath. Uh, some uh, manufacturers will recommend it still. Um, we've had problems in the past with drainage, so we do not recommend any insulation when you're using a porous surface. Uh, some other things to consider. Um, Make sure that the manufacturer that you're using has a, a fitting system that can be buried within the slab. So if someone comes along and tears up the concrete for whatever reason and you need to make a repair, you can uh, repair it and it can be sunk in the concrete without any uh, issues. Uh, another thing to consider is uh, interconnecting a pipe. You know, if you have a remote manifold location uh, out uh, next to the slab in a landscaping box or other uh, like a concrete vault. Uh, tubing running between that and the heat source, in most cases you would like to run it through the actual slab so that you're not wasting any energy. If you end up having to run it through the grass or through the building, uh, you might consider uh, a pre-insulated uh, tubing. Otherwise you would want to insulate it uh, in the field. Uh, finally, uh, just a quick note on glycol feed systems. Uh, you want to size these based on the volume of the system and the pressure needed. Um, in a standalone uh, snowmelt system or a system that's operating off a heat exchanger, so it has its own expansion system and fill, 
they're likely always going to be able to be operated with a small residential style uh, glycol feeder. Uh, there's no reason to have, you know, a large 55-gallon pressure fill system on a snow melt system. Um, you're not using the glycol feeder to fill the system. Uh, you'll fill it with a feed pump, and then you'll top it off with the once the glycol feeder is uh, connected to the system. So, like I said, size it by the volume uh, in the snow melt system and the pressure that you need. Most of these are at street level, and the boiler is either in the basement below or on the same level. So like I said, a residential system is more than sufficient and will save you tons of money. Uh, additional questions, let's see, i got a couple that came in here. Uh, for those who are requesting uh, copies of the presentation, um, it'll be posted on our website. Um, so you can just go to TEC or sorry TECMungo.com, uh, go into the training section, and it'll have all the webinars posted on there. Um, if you'd like copies of specific slides, I can uh, dig those out for you. Uh, just shoot me an email uh, down here at the bottom and let me know what slides you're looking for. Otherwise, I'd recommend just uh, going to the webinar uh, that recording that's posted on the website. All right, I think that wraps it up for the most part. Um, I got a couple questions uh, that I can answer directly to you guys. Um, but uh, again, if you have any other questions, you can contact myself, um, Bill Bailey and Bill Chanel. I apologize I don't have their information posted here, are also great resources when it comes to any hydronic equipment. Um, most of you are familiar with Ryan Hoger, who does our training, uh, is in charge of our training. And he's also familiar with hydronics, um, so if you need in a pinch, I'm sure he could help you as well. But like I said, feel free to contact me, whether it's snow melt or anything else. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thanks for your guys' times, and I'll go ahead and close up now. Uh, for those of you, sorry, that are wondering about the PDH credits, um, once we get the uh, feedback from the software, uh, Flo in our office will be sending out your uh, certificates. Uh, like I said, thanks again for coming.